Okay, so this is a mimer. Um, this was a mimer that was said for Shavuos, um, and therefore it starts off appropriately with the Ten Commandments. And we're coming, hopefully, this uh, final days of Pesach, we're coming to the Torah Chadasha, the new Torah that will come out. Now we know, very important principle, that everything that Hashem does, it starts off as a kernel and it grows into a tree. You know, everything He made has the same process. It goes from a seed, which is really quite miraculous. Like how does a seed turn into a tree? How does like a zygote turn into a human being within nine months? It's beyond human imagination, really. Um, however, be that as it may, this is the concept of how God operates. He takes, oh, you're those ca calling. Yiddo Vasmachta. Baruch Hashem. Welcome, welcome. The main thing is today, oh, the main thing is today we're learning Torah. And yesterday, what happened? Yesterday, we didn't learn. So, um, let's see here. So, this is a mimer, Anoichi Hashem Alekecha. Um, and it's a mimer on, um, it's really for Shavuos, but it's appropriate because we're coming to Mashiach, please God. We're going to see Mashiach this Achrein in Shal Pesach. It's a time for Mashiach. And so the mimer is about the giving of the first Torah. And I was saying that everything Hashem does really has the same mechanism. And the mechanism is that you have a seed and the seed grows into a tree. In other words, things start off with the kernel inside that thing, which seems very, very small this tiny thing, and yet the whole future, the whole continuation is in this thing. And the same thing is with the Torah. The first sentence of the Torah, Kecha. this sentence contains all of Yiddishkeit, all of Judaism, which Judaism, of course, is the purpose of creation. So it contains the whole purpose of creation. In fact, it goes much deeper. It goes not only the whole sentence, just the word anoichi, the word anoichi, just the aleph of anoichi. So everything that would ever manifest in terms of Torah, which is the purpose and the meaning of life, is all within anoichi, within this truth. And it comes to the word anoichi. Now it's very, very interesting because if I ask you, how do you say I in Hebrew, what would you say? How do you say I in Hebrew? Ani, I. And yet, I, yet we have, anoichi is an Egyptian word. It's not a Hebrew word. The very foundation of the entire Torah is a Naichi, an Egyptian word, which is bizarre when you think about it. The world is made out of Hebrew letters, not Egyptian words. And the answer to that is because the whole point of Yiddishkeit is not to create a religion like most religions are, in which there's a detachment from God and the person, but on the contrary, that there's a oneness, that the two become one, right? What's the goal of a marriage? Not to that you have two people that are detached, you have king and servant. No, they become one unit. Now, obviously, it doesn't mean that you lose your individuality, 
but it means individually you can become one as well. And this is a very great goal. This is the goal of life. So the Torah in general, for the 3,300 years we've been doing Torah, was only there to lead to the messianic stage. And what's the messianic stage? In which we become one, you know, the Alter Rebbe, before he went to Mizrich to study, he had two options. He could go, either go to Mizrich or he could go to Vilna. And he said that in Vilna, they teach you Torah. In Mizrich, they make you into the Torah. In other words, the goal of the Torah, it's not that there's three separate entities. There's you, there's the Torah, and then there's the times that you do the Torah. No, that's not a Jew. A Jew and Torah are one entity. They're not two separate. Like a marriage is not like, oh, you know, there's me, there's you, and then once in a while we say hello. No, that's not a marriage. That's, a, that's dating. A marriage is where there's a new entity. The me and the you become us. There's a new, there's a new entity that has a, a sum that's greater than its parts. And that's the goal of the Torah because Hashem is infinite. And even though it's very, very, very difficult for us to understand how this is possible, that's because, of course, we're coming from the finite perspective. From the finite perspective, two can't become one. But from the infinite perspective, anything can happen. Two can become one, and they can remain two at the same time. And that's the whole goal, which is that, and this is probably why Hashem has revealed quantum physics, which proves these possibilities, because Hashem did not seek to create a universe in which were his servants. He created a universe in which were his partners, which we manifest him through our good deeds. And in fact, it becomes a single entity. You know, when a Jew sees someone, feels compassion for that person, helps that person. So is God feeling compassion? Of course God's feeling compassion because he's using you to help that person. Are you feeling compassion? Sure, you're feeling compassion. Is God compassion and your compassion the same? Yeah. It happens to merge in this instance. And it happens to be that you are his tool. You are his hand. And that's what it speaks about. There are three possibilities when it comes to shlicha. So for example, when somebody's allowed to consecrate a woman uh, to be Makadish. So I could send someone, I say, I want you to consecrate the woman so that she should be my wife. So at that moment, let's say he gives her a ring. Um, obviously, it's my ring. So the question is, at that moment, what happened? Either he was my representative, or his hand becomes my hand, or at that moment, he becomes me. In other words, when you have, and so again, very difficult to understand because we're physical people, and we subdivide the reality into physical time, space, separate dimensions. But once you understand that we're actually not so physical, we're actually spiritual. And so one plus one equals two, whoever's thinking it, wherever he's thinking it, it's the same one plus one equals two. So when you're doing God's work at that moment, you are God. That's why angels have two names. They have the name that they're called when they're doing God's work. And you'll always notice it has God's name, like Michael has Kel in it, Gabriel, Raphael. Um, all these angels will have, and because whenever they're doing God's work, in that moment, they're actually God, basically. And that's why they're called in God's name. They'll speak in God's name, because at that moment, they're just a channel. They're just divine energy coming through them. And if you think in terms of energy and channels, we too can be energy channels. There's no reason why we can't. And so this is a beautiful concept, the concept of unity, the concept of oneness with Hashem, that we understand that we can literally be Hashem on earth. And whenever we're engaging in doing His will, um, and of course the Alter Rebbe, this is a very, very sophisticated mechanism, because it's not just a, it's not just hyper kind of stuff. Al-Tarebbe goes in tiny in very great detail, you know, when you're putting on tefillin, you're connecting your mind, when you're, say, giving stalker, you're connecting your hand. These are really real things, and we don't see them, but they're visual, they're, they're on a spectrum, and certainly on a spiritual uh, wavelength that can be seen, how this, this entity becomes a spiritual entity. Of course, it, 
it turns everything on its head. Because if you see the world as two separate universes, a world of spirituality, a world of physical, so then you're always running away from this world. If you're a spiritual person, you're running away. And that's why the Rebbe has an interesting teaching. He says that both science and the way people perceive religion are, are, are actually two sides of the same coin and they're making the same mistake. Because they're both saying a God and reality can't merge. So science, or not really science, but some people that perceive kind of a separate world. So they say, okay, well, we're just going to deal with the details because we can't see how the big picture and the details can merge. Other people say, no, we're going to deal with the big picture. We're just going to deal with spirituality. We can't see how spirituality and details can merge. And we say, no, they can merge. Because actually the one that made matter made energy and he could put the energy into the matter. In fact, energy is matter. You just don't see it. And so all energy can take on matter and all matter can take on energy. And so therefore every moment is a new moment of life, a new breath. It's literally the world is being recreated every second. And we have the ability to imbue Hashem in every moment in different ways. And of course there's 613 kind of parts, if you want to call it, to Hashem, where he sort of subdivides his soul into the 613 of man above, you know, and then there's 613 parts of man below. We have 613 like uh, sinews and vessel and, and blood vessels and, and 248 organs. There's actually a book by a rabbi who identifies the 248 organs. And each one of our organs um, as we do a mitzvah, we connect with that spiritual part and we have these spiritual connections. So each mitzvah connects us. And now that we're at the very end of Gullus, we have gone through multiple reincarnations. And therefore, as a whole, our body is connected to Hashem in each way in particular. We've done all 613 mitzvahs throughout many, many um, lifetimes um, because your soul needs to be complete. So you do a mitzvah here, a mitzvah there. You complete it all throughout there are only certain mitzvahs that the king has to do, and the king does it for everyone else. So I'm not an expert on the whole idea of reincarnation, but it seems like maybe we've come back as a koyin, as a levi, as a Yisrael, because certain mitzvahs only a koyin does, a levi does. So we've come through, and obviously the great tzaddikim, they could see reincarnation. They could see, um, you know, past lifetimes. And it's interesting, some people can also see it the Rebbe speaks about that, you know, every Jew, if we can become more spiritual, we can, we can get to the level where we see our previous incarnations and stuff like that. Um, one of my ancestors, um, my Bubby's um, great-grandfather, whatever, he was a very great Sadiq, his name B'nai Yisachar. Actually, his name was I forget, Elimelech, Tzvi Elimelech. And he... Um, he called his book B'nai Yisachar because his Rebbe told him that he was a reincarnation of Yisachar. And it's interesting when he, um, his, I guess his, when he, his, his uncle was a famous Elimelech of Legence. And his mother asked her brother, the great Rebbe, what to name the child. So he said Elimelech but she wasn't comfortable because by Ashkenazim, we don't give the name by a living person. By Sfardim, they do that. It's an honor. But so she named him Tzvi Elimelech. So he told her, had you named him just Elimelech, he would have been as great as me. Now he'll only be a half as great as me. So this teaches us a very important lesson in life, something that I've thought about, which is actually all of life, all of all of life boils down to anoichi. What is anoichi? Anoichi means I am. Hashem is telling us, I exist. I'm real. Follow me. I took you out of Egypt. I'm the one thing that can help you. I'm the one thing that can save you. And this is very important, obviously not because God has an ego that he needs us, but the reverse, that we need him. And we have an ego, so we need to get beyond ourselves and humble ourselves, but we have to humble ourselves to the truth. And that's why when we understand there, Hashem is there for each and every one of us individually. He's an individual God because he's infinite. And if you can find God individually, then you can have a personal God. You can have 
infinite redemption um, personally. And obviously, as you uh, ripple your redemption, you'll help bring redemption to others. So let's learn the Maimer now. I am God, your Lord, who took you out of the land of Egypt. This Pasuk is the first of the Ten Commandments that was given at Matan Torah on the 6th of Sivan. After the Jewish people preceded Nasa to Nishma. And then the supernal beings, the angels came, the kosher, the whole Echem Yisrael, and they tied for every single Jew, Shnei Ksorim, two crowns. Echel Kenegin, Nasev Echem Kenegin Nishma. So we were all there, and God gave you two crowns, one for saying Nasa and one for saying Nishma. The Chamishi V'Siv, and this came on the fifth of Siv. So in other words, first the Jews said, um, Nasa and Ishra, God said, would you like my Torah? So he said, yes, please hand it over. And um, then he gave us two crowns. Now, it's brought down in many Maimorim, the great question of great rabbis. If I had to introduce myself to you, of producing my credentials. Obviously, I'm not going to say, by the way, I was born. Oh, really? You know, so was a cockroach. I'll say, by the way, I don't know, depending what I am. I'm a doctor. I'm a this. I'm a that. So if Hashem is introducing himself to us, he's trying to get some, get our attention into who he is. Why not say, I'm the creator of heaven and earth. It's much greater than taking a nation out of Egypt. When you see us, Mitzrayim, I'll show you communism. It's true when he took us out of Egypt, there were many miracles. However, apart from the fact, it doesn't fully explain why specifically it refers to taking us out of Egypt. There were many miracles before and after he took us out of Egypt. But very, very simply speaking, when you're speaking about a miracle, you're not talking about creation. Creation is making matter out of non-existence. It's the greatest miracle that exists. When you're making matter from existence, so what does a magician do? He doesn't make matter out of nothing. He takes something, he changes it into something else. Let's say I mean, not that it's real, but he takes an egg and he turns it into a bird. Okay, when he started with matter, he changed it into other matter. It's amazing. God took water and he made it into a wall. Unbelievable. However, it doesn't compare to bringing matter from non-existence to existence. In addition to the fact that the creation of heaven and earth is a much greater miracle, Pardon? The power, the godly power in creation, creating something out of nothing is a much greater power. In other words, this is a very sophisticated Kabbalistic idea, which I don't have a good hold on, but, you know, there are different, so to say, emanations from God that come from different levels. That's why we have different names for God. They refer to different emanations. They refer to different expressions. So some expressions, like the name Yudke Vavke, re represent creating matter out of nothing. So that magic trick is much greater than the name Elikim, which is nature, which conceals matter through natural processes. So in other words, here we're talking about a level of divinity which is so great that it's much greater than the level of the divinity that makes a miracle. You do a How do you get matter coming out of nothing? It's actually higher than I mentioned. It comes from the power of atmos. What is atmos? Atmos is the essence of Hashem. What is the essence of Hashem? Shemitiyusayim atmosay. His essence comes from Himself. Something that their essence comes from themselves is something that can create something that doesn't come from anything. 
because he himself comes from nothing, so he has the power to do that. But everybody else, we don't come from nothing, we come from something, so we can only use something to make something. This that the creation of true existence is the this that the entity, sorry, not the creation, the entity of the created being is the entity of God, because you can't get something out of nothing. So ultimately, the something of reality is God. It's just God concealed. So why does it say that I took you out of Egypt? He should have said that created heaven and earth. So we can add. This that he should have said that I created heaven and earth. This is also because the creation of heaven and earth and Matan Torah, the Noichi of Ayle Kecha, who are Psicha de Matan Torah. I am Hashem, your Lord. This is the opening of Matan Torah. Shayachim Zelazar, they are interconnected. The Briya Shemaim Va'aris, Mishadesh, is Bechol Rega Varega. We know the creation, remarkably, as we've said many times, quantum physics has proven this. Creation is a continuous process. Kriterius of Al-Shanta Pasik, like the Balshanta says on the Pasik, the Oilam Hashem Varcha Nitzav Bashamai. Forever God, your words are standing in heaven. Huva Basay Fatani Kadisha, this is brought in the Tanya. Shakoya Khaliki Mahavatomid is a nibra ma'ayin liyesh. That the infinite power of God is continuously bringing existence from nothing into something. So who has the power and the ability to bring non-existence into existence to create something out of nothing? Only Hashem himself. Moving, so from this it's understood, Creation literally comes from Atlas. Now, this is very interesting because, you know, we had this uh, quantum physics professor that came and he spoke. And, you know, quantum physics has proven this beyond a shadow of a doubt that all of matter, you know, we, of course, we have E equals MC squared. So there's a measurement of, so to say, the size and the energy amount in matter. And yet that matter itself comes out of non-matter and the equation that makes that result is only if you begin with infinity so in other words it comes out of non-existence but it comes out of an infinite potential so where is infinite potential only in hashem because everything hashem made even infinity in the world of Atsilas has a specific surah, let's say infinite wisdom. It may be wisdom, but it's not, it's not, I don't know, it's not uh, kindness, it's not, it's not, I don't know, legs, right? It's a certain surah, it, 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 it comes into a certain category. Hashem has no categories, and therefore his infinity is an infinite infinity. It can be any category he wants and all simultaneously. And so therefore his ability to create out of nothing, that ability can only come from Hashem himself. So in, this is something that it says that when Mashiach comes, the neshama, our souls, will receive energy from our body. Because as great as our souls are, which they're truly very great and they're parts of God, and they contain kind of the, 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 the compassion of Hashem. Nevertheless, our bodies are God because our bodies can only come directly from God. Anything that you have, anything that you can conceive of, already in a way has a limitation because if the mind can understand it, it's already something that is limited because a mind can only grasp like a box you can only see in six dimensions you can't see beyond it 
And so therefore, the very fact that the body, which has no reason to exist, is made up of atoms, made up of energies that are popping in and out of existence. So the body itself is Hashem. It's an amazing thing that you can draw energy. You can draw inspiration from physical matter. Who would have believed that a rock can be so inspirational? Well, similarly with Torah. Now, this is a very, very important point. The point is Torah, we often as Jews, were a very historical people. In fact, it's interesting, the Chinese, the only other culture they respect are the Jews because we're an ancient culture. That's something that they take pride in, that they're an ancient culture. So we're a very ancient culture. Uh, what's also unique about us is our ability to merge the ancient and the new and maintain the best of both, but that's a separate issue. But we're an ancient culture, and we often look at life in an ancient way. We look at life, that when did we get to Tyre? 3,300 years ago. There's a cute story. <laughs> the Rebbe says the story that his um, his... He, he once had, I don't know, he just, Rebel was a great, very, even from a very young age, he was very scientifically inclined. So he once had an argument with a young person, he was speaking about Darwinism. So, so, so he told his teacher about what's going on. So his teacher says, Mendel, leave him. If he wants his yichus, he wants his lineage to be an ape, let him, be, let him have such a lineage. So as Jews, we have a very powerful lineage. We have a lineage of Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe. I mean, literally, I'm a Levi. It goes back to that tribe. You're a Yehuda. You come from, we all come from greatness. And we have very special lineages. However, it's an interesting thing. We often make a mistake because we see Judaism as a past religion. In a certain sense, we come from greatness. We have a certain humility to that greatness, which is a good thing. However, the fact of the matter is Hashem never changed. The, Shem, the same God that said, I am giving you these Ten Commandments, is giving you these Ten Commandments today. There is no difference. There's no time in God. There's no space in God. So the Torah, just as... You know, just as the very same atom that's popping in and out of existence is the same energy that came from thousands of years ago, that energy is literally coming into existence now. The same thing is the tire, the same tire, the same words, which was more than words. It was, we'll see, we'll see soon what it is. But that same energy that came into the world at that time, the unique gift that God imbued in reality at that time comes every single day. And that's why when we make the blessing for the Torah, we don't say, thank you, God, who gave the Torah. We say, who's giving us the Torah? Because the giving of the Torah is a continuous active reality. Just as the physical is coming out of Atmos every second, so too the Torah emanates out of Atmos every second. Like it says, says the giving of the Torah in the present tense. And therefore I say to say, every single day, the Torah has to be new. Chadash Mamish, literally new because it is literally new. The energy of Torah is literally been re-given this moment. So where do we gain the power that every day it should be new? Because that's really a very difficult task. You know, it's very difficult, you know, Thank God we've all been through the stage of seeking light and we find the light and it's very exciting. But how do you maintain the same excitement? How do you maintain the same, wow, I just learned something from Hashem, I just learned some Torah. So this ability 
to feel fresh, to feel renewed, was given at the t- Matan Torah, was given at the Torah. And the truth is, it's an interesting thing, because Klippa, the, the famous saying of the um, King Solomon, who was one of the wisest people to ever live, he says, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, people always think that they're so clever, that they have technology. Every single generation thought the same thing. Industrial revolution thought they were so clever. You know, every generation thinks, but really it's all the same garbage. There's nothing new under the sun. The clipper is just, I mean, I don't want to go too lengthy into it, but it's just different, it's not even different forms of distraction. It's the same stupidity, whether it's a sexual predilection, whether it's a power predilection, it's the same stupidity. It just dresses itself in what was the famous saying, that fools never die, they're reborn. It's just the same stupidity in new people. Because ultimately, you know, unless somebody's looking for content, looking for truth. And in a way, the truth also is, the one thing that truth has that that stupidity doesn't have is stupidity is just the same thing, but it has new clothing or just uh, a different, uh, a different, uh, you know, different uh, microphone. Let's call it music. Music is basically the same eight notes, okay? It's a different singer. But in terms of Kedusha, in terms of holiness, it actually can be completely new stuff because Hashem is infinite. And so therefore, whereas Klippa, eventually anybody that has experience in the world realizes that the world has nothing to offer. Now, it's not to say that we have to become, you know, monastic. The world is very important. You know, uh, it's good to have money. It's good to have comfort. It's good to have health and food. These are all good things, but it doesn't have meaning. None of those things are meaningful. Those are just tools either to survive or to help others they're tools for life they are not life itself and that's i think part of what's going on in the world today is that as some of the outside clippa blows up people are forced to come to terms with okay well the truth must be deeper than the kind of appearances and because that's all clippa can offer It has nothing real. It only has appearances. There's nothing substantive, substantial to it. However, the Torah is always substance. It's always love. It's always kindness. It's always good. And because it's coming from the infinite, it's the one thing that can always be fresh, always be new. And that's why Torah has a very interesting property to it. As long as it comes from Hashem, as long as it's real Torah, that's a Torah that's written with Ruach HaKodesh, you can always learn more. It's an amazing thing. Every time you open up the Torah, you open up the time, you talk about the, objectively speaking, the wisest nation that ever lived. And yet we're reading the same book for 3,300 years. And there's more inspiration. The Tanya, every time you read it, new inspiration. Because it's not, it's literally a communication from Hashem. And as it's a communication, it knows you. And it knows, it's almost like Google is limited. Why? Because all it has is in the information it can draw upon. But if it was unlimited, it would know who you are. And you say, I'd like to learn, I don't know, science. It could always teach you something that you don't know. Now, obviously, science itself is limited. But the Yiddishkeit, because it comes from the unlimited, is the one thing in life that is truly unlimited. Um, Or at least Torah. Has known an explanation of the Pasuk. God spoke all these things, saying, What does it mean, Lamar? It's not that God said, because normally every time when it says, God spoke all these words, Lamar, Lamar means to say it. In other words, God told Moses to tell this to the Jewish people. But here, God spoke to the Jewish people. So why is he saying Lamar to say? He's saying it directly. And you can't even say it's that we should tell our children who weren't there because every single Jewish soul, even the converts, were there. They heard these commandments from Hashem himself. 
What is Lamer here? That is that when God gave us the Torah, the power was given to all the Jews throughout all, throughout all the generations. Lamer is called what I'm Lamer. Very, very profound what the Rebbe is saying here, an extraordinary teaching. When Hashem gave us the Torah, you know what he did? He gave us the ability to tune into a new frequency. Very profound. Nothing is like the Torah. Everything else, you know, you read a book, you get it. It's funny. My daughter, so of course everyone's a little quarantined, so she told me she's re reading Harry Potter. So I said, New, how many times have you read Harry Potter? So she's a little embarrassed. She's like, I think a hundred. But this is the first time I read all five books straight. <laughs> okay. But basically, what I find in my life is if you saw a movie or a novel, how many times can you see it? A second time? Maybe a third time? Why? Because he got it. I figured it out. Meaning, how do these things keep your attention? They create a plot. They create something that might happen. You don't know what's going to happen. Then there's a conclusion. You got the conclusion. But... The Torah is the one thing that never ends. There's always more to it. And so therefore, Hashem gave us a frequency of infinity in our reality. And that's an amazing thing, that every time you're studying the Torah, you're not repeating something that was said. So therefore, you can understand it. You get it. Okay, I got it. No, you can grow infinitely. And the Torah is just the medium to communicate infinite growth to you. And that's why I say that the Torah is not limited to the five books. The Torah is in everything you see, because Hashem is always communicating. The whole world is Hashem's Torah. It's just you have to be tuned in to the message or be able to deduce it, which the great Sadiqim were. You know, the Rebbe lived his life very much in this wavelength that he was able to say, ah, Hashem's giving me a message, and he would act on that message. As I've mentioned before, my father said that the Rebbe says that the hardest avoida is hashkacha pratis. You know, there are many ways we serve God, but the hardest way to serve God is in this ability to realize that Hashem is always communicating. Why? Because it's very, we like to be comfortable. What is a comfort zone? A comfort zone is what you're used to. But to always be willing to step out of my comfort zone, say, ah, Hashem has just told me something to do. And ironically, the very great irony of life is that that's actually what we enjoy most because comfort itself is not so comfortable after a while. Comfort itself is a sense of safety, which we all like to have, but safety is boring. We like adventure. And so we have to be able to, the, the, this is a very great secret, a very great trick, is in life, the, 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 the trick of life is always having the best of both worlds. Right? So some people go tend towards safety. Women in general, you know, they're much more into their home, Basically, what they're doing is they're creating their nest, they're creating their safety. Men are much more adventurous, but men need a home. And women want adventure too. And so in a way, we complement each other because women kind of vicariously can take the uh, success of their husbands. And men certainly can, not only vicariously, they can live in the nest that women create. And so therefore, we're very lucky to have this complementary factor. However, the bottom line is that we need both in life. We need the sense of um, kind of things that are routine. We need to be able to get up in the morning and daven every day. But we also need adventure. We also need every davening to be special. We need to learn Torah every day, but we need every Torah to be unique. And that's why Hashem created an unbelievable world that, you know, it's always amazing to me that, you know, you could always see a new flower, something that you never saw before. You could, it, because the world is not a world in which it can never not surprise you. It can always surprise you. It can always be something special, something unique. And so we need to live in this balance 
of safety. I know who I am and I have my, my parts of me which are consistent, which create a certain sense of stability. I have a friend who's a psychologist and we're discussing, you know, especially in this time, it's very important for people to have routines. If people don't have routines, it's very hard. You know, I have a routine. I get up in the morning, I do some learning, I do some davening at a certain time, I make a list, I do the things I have to do. I have certain things I do different times of the day. It doesn't have to be kind of anal, it doesn't have to be 100%, but we have routines and these routines keep, especially men need routines. Davening is very important for men because davening grounds us. Men can be out of time. Women are much more grounded with time, but men are not. And so we need things that ground us. However, if you're just grounded, it could also be feel like you're being grounded. And so therefore you need adventure, you need something exciting. And so the study of Torah is a very exciting thing because, I mean, I, uh, you know, we're studying Torah, but one of the things that I try to study, I've been a little lax, unfortunately, but is I try to go through the Rebbe's, the last four years of the Rebbe's teachings every year. And I've done this for a couple of years. And it's amazing because something that I've done, it's like every time I do it, it's, it's like a whole new thing. It's fresh, it's new, it's remarkable. So that's because the Torah contains Hashem in it. And so every time you study the Torah, even what we're doing now, we can go through the same mimer. You can go through it a thousand times and it will be remarkable because it will be teaching us something new. All of our souls were there. So when we're studying Torah now, we're actually literally hearing the voice of God. So therefore, just like before, when we got the Torah, when we knew that God was speaking, we did so with great trepidation, with awe, and with reverence. So too, whenever you study Torah, like, Doc, you put on a yarmulke, you're studying Torah, there's something very reverent here. You're literally having a communication from God right now. So now we understand What's so unique about Matan Torah? Because really this is a very remarkable thing because the world until the giving of the Torah was basically a very boring world. It was very static. It, I mean, of course, there are certain people that are trying to, I don't know, let's go for an ego desire, this and that. But all of that is, it's, it's just all kind of nothing. It's all relative. If you, somebody, a lady, a very clever Jewish lady told me today, you know, it, 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 so, okay, so somebody has, let's say, a fancy car. Now imagine no one could see the car. So would they buy that fancy car? So we're in a time now where, let's say, nobody can see, everybody's quarantined, so people can't see another person's, uh, let's say, wealth or this and that. So in other words, a lot of what the society does is because maybe people have low self-esteem and they have a need, they call it conspicuous consumption. Again, there's nothing wrong with having a nice house, a nice car, things that are useful. There's nothing wrong with it. But the point is that a lot of what has driven society, certainly you know, Roman society, was actually low self-esteem. Why are they building these Colosseums? Why are they building these beautiful arches? People are, people are, are, are there was a rabbi who once said that he was in Rome, this is going back to the time of the Talmud, and he saw a beggar, a beggar next to this marble like uh, Colosseum or marble like pillar. And they came and they covered over the marble because it was raining. So, they, so he said they, they left the beggar alone. They leave, they leave the human and they're coming. Why? Because why were they into marble? Because they had low self-esteem. So they were trying to make themselves look good through marble. And... That's one of the, I think, the greatnesses of modern society is that when people are feeling more comfortable with themselves, and in a way, democracy does that. It gives you a certain sense of value, automatic value, certainly, um, you know, kind of Judeo-Christian ethics, or which is really Judeo-ethics, which gives you an intrinsic self-worth. So then the question is more about what's the meaning, what's the purpose? So... 
Um, the point is that everything is really stagnant. It doesn't really, you know, if you boil it down to its essence, it doesn't really, it's either, it's, it's like you just something that you're repeating or it's just like something that, like they say about ego, it doesn't really exist. It's just kind of a, a somebody putting on a show for somebody that's putting on a show. So that being the case, the Torah is a great gift because the Torah is the one thing that's, that's infinite. It's always, it's always growing. It's like water coming from a well. It's always, or, or, or a mayon. It's like bubbling out of the earth. It's always fresh. It's always new. It's always giving you life. It's always got something precious, something refreshing to offer. And this came at Matan because before Matan we had the seven Noahide laws, but it's stagnant. It wasn't this infinite dimension. Now we know that if the Torah asks a question, it's also truth. I Meaning you don't ask a, a, a crazy question. Let's say if you're a doctor and you're asking a question of another doctor, it's based on some kind of medical premise. So you may not have the answer, but the premise is correct. So the fact that we're saying that God could have said that he created heaven and earth, and that's a great miracle, and that's true. In fact, we find the Torah does begin with the fact that I created heaven and earth. In fact, the beginning of the laws of Judaism, as the Rambam describes, is to know that there's a first existence. So who mamsi kol nimsa? And he is the one who brings into existence all existence. And all existence only exists because of the truth of his existence. Now we should add that in the beginning of Mishnah Torah, it explains not only creation in a general sense, it discusses that everything that exists exists from his true existence. At the very beginning of Jewish laws is the knowledge that from the true existence, the existence that no existence preceded it, that is the existence that all existence precedes or comes from. Every moment is creation. If you may think, that God doesn't exist. Nothing else can exist. That even after everything exists, if the existence, the first existence wouldn't exist, it's like light. If the source of light would go away, there would be no more, it would be darkness. If God's Existence would God forbid disappear. No existence would exist at this very moment. These two things in the infinite potential of God, that creation comes from his infinite potential, and the creation is a continuous act. The Rambam writes these two really great Hasidic mystical teachings in Jewish law. So the Rebbe is emphasizing that yes, the idea that God makes everything come out of nothing is a very much part of the greatness of God. However, this is the oral tradition. This is not the written. This is not the kind of core meaning, which is that I took you out of Egypt. Because there are certain things that God wanted us to perceive through effort. Right? There are certain things that are effortless. The fact that there's a God is an obvious truth. But there are certain things that take effort. What kind of a God is he? What does he want from us? What is he doing all the time? These things don't come easily. 
These things take much effort to understand. And therefore, when you take your effort, in fact, one of the great beauties of life is effort. You know, um, Dr. Uh, Fassbinder, who's uh, into mysticism, he's a great man. So he likes to say this thing is that, like, effort is a very important part of life because we can only feel good about that which hurt us, that which cost us, that which took energy and effort to create. And so the same thing is true, this is a very great truth, that we can only appreciate a wisdom that we ourselves discover. Think deeply into this. If you didn't discover, if God made wisdom accessible, then you would never be wise. Why? Because what is wisdom? Wisdom is that which takes difficulty to understand. Like the Alter Rebbe says, you can't call somebody, a wise person is somebody that's continuously studying wisdom. Somebody that you say, oh, he knows. So that means he studied something and it's over. He's not studying. When you term somebody a Talmud Chacham, a student of wisdom, and that's the goal. The goal is to always be a student of Hashem, a student of the Torah. Because this wisdom is not a finite wisdom. This is an infinite wisdom. And so when you begin to touch the nature of infinity, you realize that actually the world itself is not the world you thought it was. It's continuously coming into existence. And it's a very interesting thing because it's a very true point. Truth only comes to those who seek it. Because if you don't seek truth, basically you end up as a blind ox. What does an ox do? He follows the herd. Wherever the herd's going, where's the herd going? Nobody knows. It's going in circles. And that's what humanity does all the time. Right? People copy people that are copying people. And so unless a person stops for a second and says, okay, what's it all about? I have a brain. God gave me a brain. I'm going to search for the truth. And that's how Abraham Avinu discovered the truth. And he changed the world through thinking. And all people that make a difference in the world, they're thinkers. They come up with ideas because it's only ideas that can move the world further. Following everybody else and being the biggest, fastest ox doesn't make you any smarter. It actually just means that you're now the blind ox making the herd go in the circle. But it actually doesn't matter because before you were going in a circle as well. So based on what we said before, that this word lemar in the beginning of Matatari is the power for it to be new. This shows us how creation is renewed. So in the beginning of Matan Torah, even before the Ten Commandments, so God is already hinting to us the idea that creation is restarting. However, we should be aware of something very important. So this is a very important concept. You know, you can ask a question, if wisdom is so great, does it mean that our original premise is wrong? Because we start off with a premise that is simple, and then we become much more sophisticated in our understanding. And the greatness of Yiddishkeit is that it's true all along the way. Your premise, the simple truth that there's a God and he's great and I need to obey him has never changed. You now can gain much deeper insight into reality, into Torah, but the simple truth remains the simple truth as well. And this is a beautiful thing about Yiddishkeit. You know, you look at other religions, they have um, Catholicism. I remember I once advertised a Kabbalah class. The only guy that showed up was a Catholic priest. 
And so he was telling, you know, we were speaking about truth, this and that. So in Catholicism, the way it works is every pope can decide what's the truth. So it's an amazing thing. You can have a billion people change what the truth is. <laughs> How can the truth change? It doesn't make any sense. But the beauty of Yiddishkeit is you have Shat, Remez, Drush, Soid. In every verse of the Torah, you have 600,000 interpretations on each four dimensions on a simple level. For what we can get it, you have a simple explanation, you have a hinting, you have an illusion, you have secret, you have inspiration. And yet none of them contradict the other one. Each one has its time and place. There's a time for looking at it this way. There's a time for looking at it that way. And none of them really contradict. And this is one of the great secrets to living a Mashiach Dika life. And it's very, very difficult for us to do this. And this is the ability, and this is actually, it's very interesting when this guy came, one of the things that his team does, they have a team of like these theoretical quantum physicists. And one of the things they do is, there's like, there's, logic has its own rules of logic, right? There's the way logic thinks. Then you have actually the way things think, the way kind of Newtonian physics works. And it's actually very similar to human logic, right? If you think about it, human logic is very much one plus one equals two. Things are, you know, here, not there. There are ways that things are structured. And that's how the physical universe basically works. It's very much in human terminology, human logic, sequences, etc. But quantum physics doesn't really use the word same logic. However, it does have a logic. And what this team of, of, of kind of theoretical physicists have done over many years is they've, they've started to learn the language, the thinking pattern of kind of the quantum atoms. And he says, you know, we began, we were like at the kindergarten level. Now he says we're like at kind of university level or the beginning of university level of the understanding. And the one thing that he said is very, very interesting. Basically, our kind of logic is based on the notion that things don't occupy the same space. So if it's here, it's not there. If it's A, it's not B, right? If it's in this time, it's not in that time. If it's in this location, it's not in that location. But there's another type of logic, another type of reality. And that is one thing can be infinite, right? So if I have a painting, that painting can't be infinite. It's either a flower or it's a rat or it's whatever. Well, you could say it's a flower and a rat, but in two separate locations. But it can't be a flower and a rat. But in quantum physics, it can be a flower and a rat. And the same thing is true as we touch the infinite. We can be multiple things at the same time. And this is very, very important for us to understand. Because the moment you understand that is you're not limited by your past. Most of us, I think, I don't want to say this out of turn because I haven't really thought this thing through. But I think that we think that I can only be one thing, right? I can, I'm a doctor or I'm a this, I'm a that. You can be many things. You can be infinite things. You can be a doctor. You can be a husband. You can be a father. You can be a son. You can be a Jew. You can be a human. You can be a rock. You can be a divine being. You can be infinite things. And the thing is, not only can you be infinite things, you can be infinite things at the same time. So you say, how can I be infinite things at the same time? Because that's all you are. You already, in a way, are infinite things at the same time. What you're really doing, and this is something a psychiatrist told me, an interesting thing is, we think that we have one identity. We're always upgrading our identity. We're always adding to who we are. Another psychiatrist told me, we're always bringing all of our experiences to the table. So in a way, what are we doing? It's like, whether you like it or not, you're part of infinity. You're always getting more experiences, whether you like it or not, that's the nature of life is you're getting more experiences. And all of those experiences are teaching you. They're all Tyra. Hopefully you're getting good messages. 
And so what's happening is you're upgrading all the time. Um, so it's very profound. In other words, what is the ultimate exodus out of Egypt is get out of your perception that you are a finite being, that you are in Egypt. You have to understand that you are an infinite being. And what it means to be infinite is not to be something, because something is already not infinite. True infinity is nothing. It's a potential. It's not an actual. The world that comes into existence, I remember this guy, the, the quantum physics professor, saying this, very interesting. It's not that the world is actually infinite and it contracts itself into a finite space or a finite being. No, it's a potential infinity. And it goes from the potential infinity into the actual finite. So we are a potential and we are kind of potentially infinite. And so within our kind of finite time space bounds, the body within our original identity conception of self, which we have to have, otherwise we wouldn't exist, that conception of self is not finite, it's infinite. And this conception of self can take on infinite data, infinite experiences, infinite information, infinite growth. And this is infinity. And that's in a way, what is Egypt? And this is the Goyesha mindset. What I said before is if you think about it, what do we do? I mean, we're also kind of part of the nations of the world, Americans. So what do we do as a nation? We, 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 we go egotistical. Okay, we're going to be the first to the moon. Or we're going to be the you know, strongest. We're going to be the best. We're gonna... What is that? That's ego. So relative to someone else, I'm a little bit better. I'm faster. I'm this and that. You know? So in other words, you've limited yourself, even if we limit ourselves. In a way, that was the mistake of the Jews. They wanted to be Egyptians. And so because they wanted to be Egyptians as a minority, you know, you have this tendency to want to become part of the majority. Um, I see it with other minorities too. They have this tendency, they want to become part of the bigger picture. Like, well, what are you becoming part of? Who says the bigger picture is a good picture? And so the point is, as a Jew, our question is not to become great. Our question is, what is great? What is truth? Connecting to infinity. Going out of Egypt means don't be anybody's slave. Don't be a slave to anybody's ego, to anybody's perception of reality. And that's really, it's unfortunate when you think about how much, how people do this all the time. The Hashem says, you are my servant, you are the servant of infinity. You serve the infinite. And this is very profound because this is an infinite leap. It's a leap right out of finite, a finite being. And I think in a way that part of like, it's a very bizarre time that we are, even from a mystical point of view, where we, you know, we come from a time, we have such great tzaddikim in the world, holy, holy people. And like we're in a time of great dearth, really, if you know the Jewish world is, not to be rude, but there's really no, very, almost no one to look up to. And so certainly nobody on the levels of these tzaddikim. And so why is that? Because Hashem is saying, I want you to become the potential that you have. And so, you know, sometimes even if it's a great tzaddik and you're looking up to him, so sometimes you humble yourself and you don't reveal your true essence. And Hashem is saying, no, you are part of me. You're part of my essence, part of infinity. Ushtari kaidem, I own you. Infinity owns you. You were first finite before you were, sorry, you were first infinite before you were finite. So we can connect this with the idea that Matan Torah was after they preceded Nasa to Nishma. It's an interesting concept. I just realized that, you know, every time we take a step back, 
We're actually taking a step forward. We're getting deeper into infinity because infinity can only come about when you pull out the finite. The finite is a cover of the infinite. And so when we strip away a layer of the finite, when you go out of Egypt, you're actually now more connected to the infinite. And so in a certain sense, if you think about what Hashem is doing, He's totally redeeming us. Because what is Egypt? Egypt is a perception of grandeur that is false. And you're attracted to that perception. And the human being, in a way, what are we? We are attraction. You know, a healthy human being has desire. Unhealthy, unfortunately, depression is you lack desire. So a healthy human being is passionate. But that passion can go in any direction. So when it goes in the wrong direction, you're trapped by your own passion. Your passion defines you. You've locked yourself in your own cage. But when that cage is broken, when God shows the Jewish people, I never really had this concept, but the destruction of Egypt was, I mean, this is based on various things, but this concept is that he was showing the Jews your whole conception that this superpower Egypt, and they were a mighty power. You know, how do people become superpowers? they have great wealth. And Egypt was very wealthy because it had, you fi find it with the Mayans, I'm not sure how it worked with Greek, uh, Greece for a while, you know, Roman, they probably stole a little, but bottom line is they had great wealth because Egypt had the Nile and the Nile just watered their land. So they didn't have to worry about money. So they had crops and they were able to probably trade and they were able to build this tremendous economy. You look at those pyramids and in fact, they had tremendous wisdom. You find societies become kind of into sciences when they have money because people become bored and they, or they're curious by nature. So they're seeking now truth and things like that or, or, or facts. And so that's when they develop kind of, you know, the medieval times are also very poor time. So the Jews, being by nature kind of smart people, they were probably very impressed by the prowess, by the science and the technology of Egypt. But they didn't realize that it was all empty. Behind it all was, was maybe narcissism. There was nothing there. There was nothing meaningful to the whole thing. And again, there's nothing wrong with science if it's being used for a meaningful end. Um, and so therefore, God, by smashing Egypt, he in fact was showing the world that your whole conception of reality is a trap. You have to get out of this slavery to the ego and become my slave because only in servitude to me are you truly free because our essence is Hashem's our essence. Our essence is kindness and compassion. But you can only manifest that kindness and compassion if you're passionate about it, because you, know, it's, you see that you know, when times are difficult, people are a little more sensitive, more caring. Why? Just because their focus is there. Before, and their focus was their ego took them over. And so being kind of really enslaving yourself to God is the only way you can become free. So this is very important. In other words, if we're talking about the freedom of an individual, it necessitates the individual's choice. Because if you enslave me, God comes and says, okay, now you're my slave. I wouldn't exactly enjoy it. I have to come to God and I have to say, please take me. Please teach me what is true. Please be my master. Because if I do that, then I am willing, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a willing servant. And the willing servant has the benefit of the master and the benefit of his passion. You marry these two things. And this is really all the Rebbe Sichas, all the talks really say the same thing. You have the benefit of the I, the ego, which is necessary. You have the benefit of passion, but you also have the benefit of the direction. You get both together. So 
this includes also the gift that came in Matan Torah, Lamer Canal. God gave us the gift that it could always be new, always be fresh. These days are reenacted every single year. These things repeat themselves as they were the first time. Furthermore, they come in a higher level. They come in a greater level. Because everything depends on our action, right? We know that the future depends on our avida, on what we do now, because God did not want to give us nama d'chsufa, bread of shame. So therefore, he made it difficult to do Torah mitzvah. So we have the Sahara, and we actually have to overcome what people are going to say to us, etc., etc. So we have effort, tremendous effort. That's why Moses looked at our generation. He was most impressed with us. Why us? We're not so great. But we overcame for a Jew today to be about shuva, to let's say to walk around with a yarmulke. This takes tremendous courage because there will always be people that are jealous. And when people are jealous, they're malicious and they'll make fun of you and criticize you. And so that's the most difficult thing for a person to kind of be criticized. And so therefore, Hashem um, created that our actions today create the reactions, our, our, little, our little, little mitzvahs done through great sacrifice, even though it's mainly emotional sacrifice, create tremendous reactions. There for every year. We have to add spiritually in our preparations for Matan Torah, to add in the idea that Hashem, Hashem kind of um, resides in a singular sense, like one man with one heart, which was on so right after Moshe Rabbeinu began to help us get ready for the Torah. How much more so when we speak about the preparation of Nasa to Nishma, preparation of saying to God, I want you to be my king. This is the main preparation for Matan Torah. To move in Gamizeh, as understood also from this, Shachan that this preparation of Domos Naslan Ishma Hiba Chamishi Besivin, that this preparation is on the fifth of Sivin, Shavua Ev Shashish Besivin. It's the, uh, this is the preparation of the sixth of Sivin. So this is like today we are the preparing for the next Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah of Mashiach, which please God will come tomorrow or the next day. This is throughout the day. We have to meditate on this concept that our will has to be given to God. That's what the Rebbe says very often. He says our ancestors literally gave their lives to God. We don't have to give our lives to God. We have to give our lives for God. And so our challenge is a different challenge. It's not a challenge of, God forbid, what they did quite heroically, which is literally give their lives for being Jews. Our challenge is to give our life for God to live in a Jewish way, to live in a spiritual and a good moral way all the time because it's the right thing to do. And that's really the greatest gift that you have everything physically good and you have everything spiritually good. This is the great goal of Hashem. He's not looking for sacrifice. He's looking for us to basically get the message, which is that life is meaningful and we are the meaning. Everything that comes to practical things, number one, just do them. After that you do them, then go become a philosopher. 
And even though today it's Arab Yom Tif, which there are many different kind of um, tear dice, there are many different worries, everybody's running around, getting their food together, etc., etc. We know that whenever you have a before a yomtif, the opposite side, uh, mainly this refers to shvuas, uh, doesn't have any power. So now we're in a very, very good space, a space in which the Yitzhahara can't really manipulate us that badly. So now is an opportune time to make this dedication to Hashem because we are, you know, the Yitzhahara is a great expert at kind of getting us to not be passionate about the right stuff. So there are five times a year, it says has satan, five times a year the satan can't get involved. Two days of Shavuos, which this mimer was about, the two days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So if we're speaking about the spiritual aspects of Shuas, as mentioned, certainly the practical aspects we have to uh, be involved in. We have to ensure that every Jew, men, women, children, you, they should be in the synagogue, when the Ten Commandments are read, as we've said many times, they said every year in Chagashvus, the Torah was given from new, as it was the first time, this is mainly revealed in the reading of the Ten Commandments, like I say, just say, God said to the Jewish people, My children, read this parsha every single year. I will consider it as if you are standing before Mount Sinai and you are receiving the Torah. Therefore, you have to listen to this parsha with great trepidation as if you're standing before Har Sinai. So there's also from the reasons why the Jewish people work very hard. Also the very young. You, Bebeisikness, that everybody should be in the synagogue during the time of the reading of the Ten Commandments. As I said many times at length. We can add that the young people should be in the synagogue when they read the Ten Commandments. This is also to the preparation that our children are preparing for us. So, not only are we responsible, but we are also sweet to one another. We love one another. Similarly, the great preparations to add in the learning of the Torah, the inner dimension, outer dimension, until the, um, God spreads the um, teachings of Siddhas everywhere. This includes also the um, preparations to organize um, these um, Torah gatherings, the Yisrael Chag Hashfus, the Rebbe wanted us to organize Torah gatherings, Mama Tzayin at the time of the giving of the Torah, or the days that are close to it. Amalel, like I said before, Shabbat Shona every single year, we have to add all these things, with great Additions, both regarding the preparations of things that come before Matan and the Haman Agela Chotas Tevis, also regarding good resolutions, Bishtadus, Benegela, Yonama Shechem, Mama Tesenu, and to prepare things for um, the giving of the Torah by Yom Shalachab and the days after. The formula L. I said before, Shabbat Shona, that every single year it's sort of 
we have to add in the preparation for Machen Teda, Prat Bachana, Daktamas Nasa and Nishma, especially the preparation of Nasa to Nishma, Barav Chagashvus, by Yideza Gama Inyan, the Matan Teda, the Kabbalah, the Teda, the Chagashvus. Through this, we also get the Torah, and during the festival of Shvus, who Badagan Ayos Yosa, on a much higher level. Until a level which is infinitely beyond. To the extent that every single year, calling on Avelu, all these things, they're literally new. They're at such an infinitely greater level that it's a new thing. Especially this year, Especially this year, that was a 1989 Tavshin Mem test, which is the preparation for the year of Tavshin Nun, 1990, which is 5750, very, very, very significant year, which has the acronym, it will be a year of miracles. Vagamash on Azu, also this year, Erev Tavshin Nun, Toyim and Farman Nisim Bet Tavshin Nun, we're already tasting of the miracles in Tavshin Nun. There has to be a preparation uh, with great. Um, um, uh, excitement by Yideh HaYisafim Yideh Shana B'Shana and through adding every single year B'Achonis L'Matan Teda with the preparation to Matan Teda Mi Tais V'Gam V'Inyan L'Matan Teda we add also in Matan Teda itself Ad L'Yisafim Shabayin Adayich also we add infinitely more V'Oyif N'Shal Chidosh in a renewed way the Gam Shainyan L'Matan Teda that even though the idea of Matan Teda V'Oyif N'Shal Chidosh in a renewed way Hu V'Mesh V'Kolim V'Yashana is throughout all the years Kanal uh, throughout all the days of the year Kanal Sif Beis the main thing about the Torah, but even in a new way, this is in the time of the giving, giving of the Torah. Vihine, kamoishim matan Torah, pamer yishen, just like matan Torah the first time. Now to take a pikiim oilam, the world became strong, strengthened, because we know our sages teach us. Kamar mechazal al apostik aretz yara v'shakata. The whole world was shaking because God made a tanai, he made a condition with the world, I guess the spiritual forces that are in charge of parts of the world, that if the Jewish people accept the Torah good, if not, I return you to dust and ashes. It all goes back to naught. And so they were always worried, are the Jewish people going to accept the Torah or not? And when the Jews said, Nasev and Nishma, we will accept the Torah, the world calmed down. So also, every single year, through adding and the giving of the Torah, the receiving of the Torah, there is a um, addition I am the strength of the world. And this is something that's very, very important, especially for our time now, where there is a great uh, uncertainty in humanity, that through our creating a powerful conviction that we're here to serve a God, no matter in good times or in bad times. So therefore, this creates a stability in the world. The whole world was actually made for this choice. And so when Jews, make this choice, we bring stability to the entire cosmos. So through this, we reveal also the uniqueness in the world, that the world is renewed every second with the power of Atmos, we can say that this thing, the power of God, and creates the world out of nothing. This is the true idea of calmness. And based on this, we can say, this that every year that we have to prepare for Matan this is included in adding in the three pillars that the world stands on, which is the pillar of Torah, the pillar of Aveda prayer, and the pillar of Milchsad of goodness and kindness. And Bafrat stuck especially charity. Apart from the fact that charity is one of the pillars of the world, 
Hukam calls Kol Teres also the entire Torah. From the Vor, but Torah Or, Divra Mas Chodesh Shlishi, as it says in Torah Or, Chodesh Shlishi, because God is a giver, and we too must be givers. So when we're givers, we bring, we create that reaction that God becomes a giver too. Because ultimately, if I'm studying Torah and praying, it's in a way it's for me. But if I'm giving charity, it's for someone else. It's a very altruistic act. And so therefore, by giving charity, we literally create that God becomes charitable, and we create that the world becomes stable. So therefore, in addition, as we always do, we give everybody a dollar bill to become a messenger for charity. has to be in the um, introduction to the month of Shavuos. Arab Zman Matan Tersenu, the introduction to the time of the get, giving of the Torah, is Safmi Yuchetz Basinus Staka, an extra amount of giving Staka, Ba'anshin Asinus at Staka, B'yemz, Tia Ba'oifin Shel Psicho Chadosho. This extra Staka should be in a way, so this motivates me, I'm going to give to Chabad, that, I mean, Kel Chabad some money, um, to, 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 it should be a renewed, we should, we should open up a new sinner, a new gateway. This guy, very interesting story. Um, I heard it from the guy himself. Um, unfortunately, it was after Gimel Tam was after the Rebbe was on high. So he had a very bizarre, I don't know what kind of pregnancy his wife had. It was twins. And the doctors basically said, maybe you should abort one of them. One of them is definitely going to die. The other, it's a question. You know, if you abort one, it's going to be better. Anyway, so he asked, he went to the, he went to the Rebbe's letters. A lot of people, they open up letters of the Rebbe. And the letter was to sponsor a Torah book. And it says that if you do that, you open up a new window to heaven. And he literally, he was, he was very, very poor at that time. He, he, he went to a guy who, who was a publisher. He says, I want you to sponsor books and put it on my credit card. The guy says, I can't take money from you. He says, you have to do this. You're doing me a favor. He says he didn't have money for milk. And he was sponsoring books. And that week, believe it or not, his wife got into a business, which they support themselves till this very day from. And his daughters, they had like 20 surgeons at the, at the birth. Um, and I think maybe like 20 neonatal surgeons and obstetricians and this and that. And it was like, they, I, I think his wife was there when she was saying the story. She, they, she was, they were like holding up parts, like this doesn't work, that doesn't work. It was just like pure miracles. So this is something that Rebbe seems to be indicating here, that we can open up a new kind of window. And um, so through this new window, we open up a uh, from God's open hand, is open, holy, broad hand, for all things. Especially the idea of this begins from the first. Um, statement, I took out of the land of Egypt. We go out of all boundaries and limitations. We become one with the giver of the Torah. This thing that we go out of all boundaries comes as a soul in the body. For infinite days, a healthy body, and a healthy soul. They they limit Galia the Teda, and through the learning of Galia the Teda, of the re- revealed part of Teda, a Guf the Teda, the revealed part of Teda, the Teda, and the inner dimension of Teda, and the Shmosa the Raisa, the soul of Teda, Shishnei, and Teda, Achas, which are one Teda, Nasim Gama Gufa, and Hashem, Shalom, Adam, Aleb, and Siyas Achas, so we become one entity. And Siyas Shehi Chadim, and Noichi, entity that is one with God, Noichi, and Teda, the giver of the Teda. Through announcing these things in a great uh, synagogue, in a synagogue that Torah is studied, in a synagogue that prayer is done, the idea of prayer is we ask our needs, our spiritual needs, our physical needs, 
Hine Yidei Zin Tesvei Yidei Zin Tesvei Now we add in all of this, Shekadosh Baruch Hu Eizu L'Kayim Is Kol Chatzos That Hashem helps us to fulfill all of our um, <clears throat> All of our resolutions, Shehem Bakashu, who fills our prayers, the Chonus of Matan Teda, the preparation for Matan Teda, the Gamma Mala Bakashu, and the Gela Mshachus of Matan Teda, he also fulfills the will regarding drawing down from Matan Teda, Prashim, Sam Baisham, and Gavan Beit Spila, especially that we're in a house that um, we have in it, uh, sorry, that we're teaching Torah, Sham Shachus of Teda, Tia Bishlamus, that the drawing down of Teda should be complete. In a completely new way. The extent that it's a new uh with the complete redemption through Mashiach. And we can add the Inu Matan who, but the idea of Matan is Nesina Sotera the Matva Ars to give the Torah down here on earth. In a way that is not in heaven. Like I say, just say, because Baruch Hu the God says, to the angels, I and you will go by, we will go to the base in Shalmata, we will go to the court below. Basically, they come down here to study what the law is because the law has to be decided, obviously, in the way according to Allah, Supreme Court, majority rule, and all that stuff. So, based on this, when the Jewish people down here make a law based on Torah that the time for redemption has arrived, because everything has ended, Jewish people have already done Shuvah, King Yakum, take a Gulu, so it will be, and immediately the redemption will come. The Hoysa we can add. Festival of Shuas is connected to the Moshe Rabbeinu. The Moshe Kibbal Tehidim is Sinai. Moshe received the Torah from Sinai. Umasra, and he gave it until he gave it to the 120 members of the, um, they were called, it was like a Supreme Court called Anshik Nesel men of the Great Assembly, Shame. Omdu, they said, create many students. The idea of Creating many students, this is every single Jew, and Nashim and Nashim Ataf, men and women and children. The explanation is that each one of the students, we each become a pillar, that uh, they all become pillars that, upon which the whole world stands. And the festival of Shuas, Shaykh the David Amelech, is connected to David Amelech, the Baal Shemtov, and the Baal Shemtov, Shiyem, Yilu, Shalahem, who Shuas. Their um, festival is on Shavuos. Because the idea of the renewal of creation is the explanation of the Baal on the verse. Your words are forever in heaven. Which is the verse of Tehillim. Which is through... David, the sweet singer of Israel, they both had a yard sign in Shavuos. Lachan Yemei Chag Shavuos, Hei Mesugulim B'Yochud, Limit B'Fatsa Zotere Ba'Ifin Demide Talmidim Harbe. Therefore, the days of Shavuos are very, very apropos for this idea, for the learning of Chassidus, and for the teaching and the establishing of many students. Shavuos, Limit B'Fatsa Zotere Ba'Yayim, in our studies every single day. How much more so every single year? We should do it in a way that we continuously ascend to the way that we're doing it in a new way. Through the renewal of Torah, we reveal what's unique in creation. That all creations, everything is coming into existence every second. On the other hand, through spreading this idea that the world is being created, recreated every second, which is from the fundamental of Chassidus, through this we bring closer Mashiach, then we'll have the true wonderful renewal of Torah, a new Torah, we can say this is also the connection of the beginning of the Torah with the beginning of Matan Torah. The beginning of the Torah is that 
Hashem created a heaven and earth. From this we come to the Eivish that says all these things. Which includes the idea that God took us out of Egypt, which includes the idea that he's going to take us out of the present exile to commit and in place where it is a continuation of the first redemption. Similarly, the Mishnah Torah, the Ramam Shasholos Hish Yesham Matirishin. The beginning is that there is a first existence who Mamsi Kol Nimsa, and he um, brings into existence all existence, Cholon and Soy Mishamayim Ba'aretz, and everything that exists from heaven to earth and Masha Bineim, and what's between them. Le Nimsu Elama and Mitzisim Matir. They only exist from the truth of his existence. Yeshleimar, we could say, Shem Mishamayim Ba'aretz. That from heaven and earth and what is between them, this is similar to the heaven and earth. The heaven to include the um, um, all the hosts of heaven and the earth to include all the hosts of the earth. From this we continue to the end of Mishnah Torah, in your the idea of redemption, while the same place in the Mishnah Torah, until the conclusion of Mishnah Torah, that the world will be filled with the knowledge of God, like water covers the seabed. Through our actions, especially in the preparation for Matan Torah, and the receiving of the Torah, especially after we have already completed the video called Amidois, and we've refined all of our emotions, from chesed to chesed till Because is a preparation to Matan begins with a noichi. I show you the time that took you out of Egypt in your the idea of redemption. And we conclude that God will be the king. He will reign forever and his, he and his name will be one. The idea that God will be one is connected to the sphere of Malchus and especially Malchus of Malchus. Afterwards, we say that the righteous will praise his name. They will sit securely and see his face. And all this has been announced in a place where Torah and prayer are increased. So it's certain that immediately redemption will come. It will be the completion of Malchus, Malchus of Beis David, the completion of the Malchus of Beis David, the Gamma Chusish and also the Malchus of Moshe, the Baal Shem Tev, also the Baal Shem Tev. And all of the Rebbe's after him, the man Malkit Abonon, and who is um, the uh, kings, that these are the rabbis, uh, and all of this will be immediately, it won't even take a moment, with great joy and gladness, Below, meaning right here, the take of Umiyad Mavish immediately. Amen. Amen. Well done. Yes.